Hey folks, Professor Diffley. We're at Unit 8 here. Uh, this is the first of the lecture videos. Uh, so, as usual, we have uh, the assignments for the week. You got an exam and a discussion board. The discussion board is on nativism, a part of the uh, chapter doing with immigration. Um, there's also uh, uh, three videos to watch. Um, with the last video uh, for this chapter, uh, only watch to the eight, uh, around the 8 minute, 12 second mark of the video. Uh, that ca uh, Beginning part covers a lot to do with the uh, immigration, uh, Mormons, and others. Uh, the rest of the video deals with abolition, which we'll get to um, in a later unit. So let's go through the slides a bit. Um, this week, there's actually a lot of information in the slides, a lot in the notes, uh, and in the actual slides themselves. Uh, there's also videos on the market revolution and immigration, uh, which uh, do a great job on it. Uh, so uh, definitely watch those. Uh, they mirror and uh, complement uh, the materials here. So now we're in the uh, market revolution, changing nation. Uh, here the countries begin to look a little bit more like the modern uh, nation you live in today. Um, and so why would you have, in the first half of the 19th century, you have uh, massive innovations in transportation, communication, and production methods that really begin to change uh, the way we live as, uh, as uh, people uh, and change the nation. So that's gonna be a big part of this. Again, always look at the notes for all this. Um, Here's just, uh, you know, kind of showing them. Um, you have steam power. You have uh, steam power on boats, trains. You're going to have uh, the telegraph allowing instant communication. We have faster travel. We also have uh, the beginnings of industrialism here in the uh, United States, uh, or the speeding up of it, at least. Um, and uh, this is all going to uh, really reshape the world. Um, so uh, the first part here is really looking at innovations in transportation. Um, one of the first things you get are new roads, uh, 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 turnpikes. Um, this is really the first uh, transport and overland, uh, tra first advance in overland transport you've had in a while. Uh, turnpikes are paid rolls, uh, paid roads, just like, you know, the mass pike, uh, things like that. And we all know how we feel about them. Uh, you can even imagine how it was back then. Uh, today, they're operated by states and others. Uh, back then, they could often be um, private. Uh, we saw a lot of these in the uh, New England uh, and the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, and as you can see, there's 900 of them created. Uh, there was a national road for the first time, a uh, road uh, connecting uh, Maryland and the old Northwest. Uh, so, you know, we're not there yet. You're going to see more of this in the 20th century, later 19th century, but mostly 20th century. But, uh, you know, problem with turnpikes was they costly to maintain, expensive. That's why a lot of people avoid the pike uh, and other toll roads today. Um, it's also, you don't have the transportation uh, methods yet uh, that you really need. Right? You're still using horse-drawn uh, wagons. And as always, people are going to find ways around the shunpikes not having to pay. So it's the beginning. Uh, it's making it a little bit easier to get from here to there. But we're still over a century uh, away from having uh, the uh, road networks that we have uh, in, in uh, the United States today. I mean, you can see some of these, uh, what these turnpikes look like. I mean, they're a little more than dirt roads in reality. Uh, they're not the paved superhighways that we get after World War II. Uh, there, uh, yeah, some more in central New York. Uh, here's some more, again, <clears throat> in Massachusetts. Uh, this shows some of the ones, uh, the Talcott Mountain Turnpike um, uh, from uh, Framingham uh, and, and Connecticut. Uh, here's some, again, you can see the uh, roads built around them. So they still... Uh, Still, you know, follow some of the same ways, uh, you know, but they, they've uh, uh, diverged over time. Uh, but the biggest uh, change, really, um, the two, one of the bit, two biggest change was uh, the steamboat. Um, uh, well, the real important thing about the steamboat is it allowed you to uh, travel upstream on rivers. Uh, usually you'd have to go, uh, you couldn't really, very hard to go upriver uh, against the current, the flow of the river. Um, but you get Robert Fulton, um, who adapts steamboat technology uh, to create uh, river boats. Um, and steamships later, these will be used on the oceans, the Great Lakes, uh, everywhere. Uh, again, it shows that you can now sail up, up, uh, up river, upstream, and now you can uh, uh, transport goods, people, quickens time. Uh, it's easier to transport on water, that sort of thing. We still, even in the modern world, 21st century, we still use a significant amount of goods are, are, are transported by boat. Um, so this was a major major innovation. Um, but yeah, Fulton's uh, the Claremont in 1807 uh, was a major, uh, major innovation. Uh, here's a depiction of the uh, Claremont. Uh, here's a replica built later. Um, as you can see, I mean, in reality, these early ones, really just uh, your old uh, wooden tall ships without the masts uh, and just replaced uh, with steam engines. 
Um, but again, you know, by 1849, you can start to see more and more steamships uh, 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 in the harbor in New York and elsewhere. Um, and another big change here is that, yeah, you see you have uh, more canals as well, and that's what we're going to go into here. Uh, canals linked waterways. Um, the most famous and largest of these was the Erie Canal in upstate New York. Um, yeah, this was uh, enlarged, but this is, uh, you know, twice later to accommodate newer boats. Um, 363 mile canal uh, let goods flow between the Great Lakes and New York City, making it easier uh, to transport goods. You're going to get migration from New England over to this area. Um, that's why it's interesting with New York accents. Uh, if you go into Western uh, New York up there, especially places like Rochester, uh, the people have accents that are different than downstaters or even other parts. Uh, you can always tell someone from Rochester because uh, they sound more like a New Englander uh, than they do a New Yorker in many ways. Uh, New York finance this, uh, you know, turns it helps turn it into an industrial center and trading center, um, and it continues today. And you can see these canals. Um, we have canals all around uh, here in Western Mass, but th this is a massive, massive canal. Um, again, showing uh, in Medina, um, showing the construction of it. Um, really, really does help connecting. Um, and you can see even more, again, the roads uh, and canal uh, construction. You're going to have more and more of this over the years. Um, <clears throat> now, why is this all important? Um, you know, this really helps uh, integrate and uh, the economy and uh, make it more diverse. I mean, really, at this point, uh, most things up until, and for a while after this, uh, people, you, you got things that were made in your local areas. Um, it, you didn't often purchase goods that were made uh, other places because uh, shipping them was so so expensive uh the steamboats and canals help uh, and later the railroads uh will continue with this too the railroads especially as uh, steam powered engines uh are going to uh, change our concepts of space and time you know how long it takes to get places how far something is becomes much different uh we view it um uh, it's actually in england where they invent uh the first uh, uh steam powered trains um and that was george stephenson's the rocket it's called the rocket because it went so fast 24 miles an hour um it's uh, you know which is silly compared to today's standards but again really changes everything um you know in the u.s you had peter cooper and others working on engines at the same time and they're going to be deployed here but this is really a major major change in transportation um here you see pete cooper's peter cooper's tom thumb uh you know uh one of the first locomotive engines on the bno railroad uh, which you probably heard of uh from uh, uh monopoly and others it's the first engine in the U.S. to pull passenger cars. Interestingly, when they first made trains, uh, they really did believe it was going to be mostly for transporting goods. Um, but they quickly realized how much people wanted to use them uh, to commute to work, to get between places, how much it easier it made. Uh, it really does, here in the United States, opens up vast new areas uh, in America for settlement. Uh, why? Because now you could bring goods there easily. We're, you know, we're beyond now having to go uh, the pioneers, um, you know, the Oregon Trail people going out on covered wagons i'm mean, having to bring everything here now you can transport goods you can be out there later you're going to get uh mail order catalog so you can you know even if you're far away from people the trains could bring you your goods that and again you could um have transportation for passengers uh here is uh early days of rail tra uh, uh rail and canal travel this is the dewitt clinton in new york uh state uh, uh one of the first locomotives you can see this first train i mean take a look at this what would you really see i mean it's, it's a very rudimentary early one um but especially you can see uh the idea was uh they were you know essentially uh uh, uh horse and carriage carriages just uh put on rails uh that sort of thing here's another uh depiction of it that will obviously change over time Another great invention, uh, or great in the sense that it changed uh, the world here, was the invention of the telegraph by Samuel Morse, um, allowing, uh, at the time, instant communication. Uh, telegraph, you know, it's invented in the 1830s, instantaneous communication uh, through telegraph. Uh, and it allowed you to communicate uh, by electrical pulses, uh, really first used in 1844, but it helps uh, speed flow of information, news, um, business info. Uh, really begins to bring uniformity to prices and commodities, really does help uh, connect us and unite us uh, uh, in a modern sense. Um, and you can watch the video, and it's a dots and dashes. There's a whole language to uh, using uh, Morse code uh, today. Uh, again, part of this leads to uh, growth of the West as a new region. Uh, for the first time, 
start getting millions of people move across the Appalachian Mountains into what now we would call the center of the country. You get all these new states pop up, <coughs> excuse me, and enter the nation. Um, Maine's the outlier there. Maine had originally been part of Massachusetts. Now it's its own state uh, in the uh, early uh, 19th century. But all these new ones, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, and you get uh, different people begin moving out west more and more. You get uh, people moving um, uh, deeper into the south with slavery, something we'll see in the next unit. Um, you get people moving out of the south to new farmlands. Uh, into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and New Englanders moving into New York, Northern uh, Ohio, Indiana, and all that, looking for uh, new opportunities to farm, to live, all that. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that even the U.S. did not necessarily own all this territory, that did not prevent American settlement. Uh, people just began to move in, uh, you know, especially here you get Florida later, uh, Texas and Oregon. Um, other countries own these. Native American tribes and groups own those, uh, but Americans are going to force their way in. But uh, we'll see more of that uh, as we move forward. Um, you know, you can see how it changes travel times uh, 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 there. I mean, it really used to be uh, just you know going from New York, uh, you know, Springfield to Boston uh, could have taken uh, you know a, a very long time. Today we could do it in hours. You know, you can just imagine uh, how quickly it goes uh, there. Uh, here's more people just, you know, squatting. Squatting is when you just take over land that you don't necessarily own. Um, and that and you start to get that more and more as people move out west. Um, but you do start to get uh, more of uh, what we know as the cotton kingdom as people begin to shift westward. Um, uh, you know, this also leads to a expansion of slavery uh, and more and more people move uh, with the cotton kingdom. Um, uh, and it really does help uh, grow it. But it also, again, unfortunately, uh, leads to more and more slavery there. Uh, one of the factors, Eli Whitney, inventor of the cotton and gin, um, you know, this inadvertently led to an increase in slavery because so it was very hard to um, process uh, cotton uh, by hand. And so, uh, but this is a new machine that allows, very simple rudimentary machine that allowed it to uh, 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 clean and process cotton, um, which only made it more in the economic interest of uh, slavers and cotton producers. To increase slavery. So uh, this is a unfortunate, unintended context. Uh, it was originally hand powered, but later, just like everything, they're going to hook steam engines and electricity up to it. Here you can see this video. What it does is really just remove the seeds uh, from there. This also leads to an, uh, a rise in the internal slave trade. Even though the Atlantic slave trade uh, uh, had been banned, now what you get is something called the uh, New Middle Passage, where people moving from the Old South into this new Deep South um, and the West moving their slaves. So unfortunately, you'd see these slave castles, uh, couples, forced marches in the deep south of uh, groups of slaves being moved from one area to the other. Um, and, and again, this this had the unintended conquest, uh, contest of moving slaves within the United States. I mean, they even made maps about this showing where slaves were moving. Uh, you could see the growths in uh, uh, states and all of that uh, there. Um, and again, this also leads to more and more car uh, uh, commercial farming. Um, you allow for uh, increased settlement. Uh, you have more tools, mechanized equipment, like made large-scale farming uh, uh, more possible with less human labor. So instead of just making food to sell in your own area now, you could pop them on trains and sell them uh, nationally. Um, eastern cities, and that became markets uh, for these. They become creditors, uh, all of that. So th they're all tied together again in this new market. Um, here again, you get staple crops. This is commercial farming. Um, these were usually bought at home, and now they're uh, you know made around in the local area. Now they're made uh, further afield and shipped around. Uh, one thing helping it is again, like I said, new uh, technologies. This again, simply just using steel plows. Uh, John Deere uh, mass produced uh, allowed uh, easier opening up of the prairie lands. Here you can see the mass produced later, much later, of uh, these plows. Um, me mechanical reapers. Cyrus McCormick again help making you, uh, it easier to um, cut down, reap uh, fields of wheat. Uh, now one man could do the work of uh, many, many uh, uh, individuals. Um, and so you could uh, reap exponentially more wheat, um, grow more, sell more, uh, really leads to less farmers in the long run, but producing more. Uh, I love that. Here's just some of the early blueprints for this uh, and shows how the wheat is uh, harvested and then baled and just makes it one person could do the work of many, many. All right, we'll come back to this in lecture two uh, with urban growth, and we'll continue this.